All right, both sides ready? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Right, let's begin. We'll begin with the uh, appellant's argument, of course. May it please the court. I'm Ryan Owen, and I'm counsel for Jack Capital LLC. I reserve three minutes for rebuttal. You got it. The case about enforcement of a mortgage lien where the homeowners claim that the mortgage was forged. The lower court found that the homeowner signed the mortgage yet denied enforcement of both the mortgage and an equitable lien on the basis of a third party's fraud. It's also a case about entitlement to attorney's fees. This court should reverse the lower court because it failed to follow binding precedent from the Florida Supreme Court and the district courts of appeal. I'd like to start by discussing two key findings of fact by the lower court before I move on to the legal issues. Those findings of fact are not being challenged in this appeal. Only the lower court's conclusions of law are being questioned. And the appellees have agreed in their answer brief that the standard of review is de novo. First, the lower court found the Adams signed the mortgage. Jack Capital's mortgage foreclosure action should have turned on this fact, as the Adams quiet title complaint was based solely upon forgery. Fraud was not pledged as a basis for invalidating the mortgage. So let me ask you a question. The Adams is defended solely on the basis we didn't sign the mortgage, not that someone else signed it, because I thought they alleged the alternative. We didn't sign the mortgage, therefore our signatures were forged. And then there was a, a forgery expert to testify that they were not forged. The Adams defended based on someone else having signed their names on the mortgage, but their testimony was that they signed it. The court- okay, I, I thought that the, Mrs. Adams said, I didn't sign it, but Mr. Adams said, well, I might've signed it, might've been put in a, a big batch of papers. I might've signed, might be my signature. So Mrs. Adams signed, that's or testified, that's my signature, but I didn't sign a mortgage. And Mr. Adams testified essentially the same thing. And the, and the judge said, therefore there's no forgery, but the judge gave relief on the basis of fraud that wasn't pled. The judge's final judgment doesn't use the word forgery. Uh, what the judge says, and this is in paragraph 23 of the final judgment is that their signatures were not obtained on the mortgage knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily. Um, if the judge had found that they hadn't signed the mortgage, he would have stopped there. He wouldn't have used the words knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily. Additionally- and what does that do to, the, to, this, to this proceeding? If they sign something not knowingly and intelligent, doesn't the case law still sink their ship because there's no connection with JAK Capital having knowledge of the fraud or doing anything wrong? Is that true or false? That is true, Your Honor. If the court finds that they signed it, but their signature wasn't knowingly, intelligently, voluntarily obtained, the, the fact that it wasn't knowingly, intelligently, intelligently and voluntarily obtained- That may make not... it un, unenforceable as to the uh, scam artist here, let's, for lack of a better term, who has since disappeared with the funds. Correct. Never made a payment. Er Erico, I think his name was. Yes, Your Honor, and that's why this court should reverse. The lower court failed to follow binding precedent from the Florida Supreme Court and the DCAs. Does it make court. a difference that the notary notarized signatures he never saw signed based upon Erico's meeting with him at the Olive Garden? I knew the Olive Garden was going to come up, Your Honor. Um, no. You guys argued it extensively in the briefs. It's, it's about the most in interesting fact in the case, um, that the mortgage was notarized at uh, Olive Garden without the Adams being there, but mortgages don't have to be signed or notarized in order to be enforceable against the uh, borrower. That was a basis for a motion for summary judgment that was denied uh, immediately before the trial started. So well, it does show though, if in fact a mortgage is notarized, presented to the bank or the JAK Capital, that it appeared regular on its face. They, Correct. Have, they don't have to go behind the mortgage and say, well, where was it notarized? And is that really his signature? They're entitled to rely on a document on its face that looks valid. Is that is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Okay, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Not at all, feel free to interrupt. I don't mind at all. Um, so the other fact that the court found that the signature was, uh, the mortgage was signed by the Adams is that the Adams submitted a proposed final judgment that the court worked from and uh, it, in the proposed final judgment, they said uh, that they wanted the court to find that the plaintiffs did not sign the promissory note and did not consent to any mortgage on their property. The court deleted that finding and replaced it with the court cannot conclude that the signatures on Exhibit 1 were obtained knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily, given the multiple concerns regarding the business practice of Market King. Now, the Appley's answer brief seems to argue that that finding is tantamount to a finding of forgery, but it's not. 
Forgery occurs when one makes a writing which falsely purports to be the writing of another. Um, thus, it is not forgery when a third party fraudulently induces someone to sign a document. And Judge Valenti, you've already touched on the second key fact, that there was no finding of fraud on the part of Jack Capital, and there was no basis in the lower court's record for there to do so. Well, there was a motion to amend the pleadings to conform to the evidence, but that was actually objected to and, and denied. Is that correct? That is also correct, Your Honor. So um, had that been granted, we might have a different appeal, but we don't have that. I don't think we would, Your Honor, because I don't think that when they were seeking to conform the uh, complaint and the uh, answer to the counterclaim to the testimony, they were seeking to add any particular fraud defense. All of the fraud uh, that's mentioned in the answer brief was really circumstantial evidence of forgery. And but it was it's fraud not fraud the... that would be actionable in terms of preventing a foreclosure by the third party bank here, let's say. That's, that's correct. Because um, the, the Adamses did a preventive strike. When they found out there was a foreclosure brewing, they preemptively filed a deck action on, on the basis of the mortgage documents being forged, not that JAK committed some fraudulent act. It, it was somewhat of a belated preemptive strike, though. Uh, well, looking they, at they the facts to the punch case, in terms of a lawsuit. Right. The, um, the mortgage was placed on this property well before the action was filed, and the uh, yeah, the mortgage was placed on a property before the action, but what I meant was a foreclosure wasn't filed when they filed their deck action. Correct. The foreclosure okay. was brought as a counterclaim. Okay. Uh, but it, the Adams had received a satisfaction of their prior mortgage from HSBC well before uh, this action was filed, and they didn't bring this action until uh, after they started receiving default notices and pre-foreclosure letters from Jack Capital. Um, and sticking with the foreclosure, the mortgage foreclosure action for just a moment, uh, the facts of this case are very similar to both Barron versus Estate of Clare and Grandway Credit Corp versus Westbrook. Uh, now, the Adams answer brief misrepresents the holding of Barron, uh, as the court having found the mortgagor was desirous of borrowing $7,500 and therefore signed the mortgage and received the loan proceeds. Uh, that opinion explains that Mr. Clare was only desirous of a loan because he'd suffered a stroke and was being manipulated by his caretaker to borrow the money. Uh, he was Barron an was incompetent pleaded. person. He, correct. So it was and a he, capacity case. But the but the mortgage was was not voided in that case either. It, it wasn't a trial court and the appellate court. Uh, on appeal, it. yes, I understand. Uh, as the court should do in this case. Um, and in that case, it, the holding of the trial court was that it could not be enforced because it was permeated by the fraud of the caretaker. And the fourth district's basis for reversing was not only that was there no evidence that the lender participated in the fraud, but also that the trial court acted outside the pleadings by refusing to enforce the mortgage where fraud was not pled. Uh, Grandway Credit Corp is a forgery case um, where the borrowers or mortgagors claimed that they didn't sign it. Um, now, the, in that case, it was another reversal because the, uh, there was no competent and substantial evidence to support the trial court's finding that they didn't sign the mortgage. And the, the evidence that the appellate court said should have been followed was an expert testifying that they signed their signatures on the mortgage were valid. And the fact that the documents said mortgage or within an inch and a half of their signatures. And in this case, exhibit one admitted into trial is the mortgage and it says that it is a mortgage on the signature page. Additionally, there was a guarantee signed by the Adams. It's a single page document that says they're guaranteeing a loan to Market King, which was Erico's company. Um, so even if we had a higher burden of proof, I, I think we would fit under the Grandway Credit Corp. But in this case, we don't have that burden of proof. We are accepting the trial court's finding that they signed the mortgage. Uh, and then I'd also refer the court to the Dines case because it's substantially important because there was fraud in the inducement by the son-in-law in that case. And that was not a bar to enforcement of the mortgage. Um, and I think the record is also clear that this was a forgery case, not a fraud case, and there were no amendments to the pleadings and we didn't try the issue of fraud by consent. Um, if the defendants, the Adams, who are the plaintiffs, defendants on the counterclaim, 
wanted to invalidate the mortgage based upon fraud, they should have pled it with specificity as required by Rule 1.120B of the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure. Did you want to talk about the equitable lien argument issue? I, I do, Your Honor. I would just point out first that if the court reverses on the issue of the mortgage being valid, you don't even reach the equitable lien. Um, it's only a, a backup argument. And it's only for fifteen thousand and change. It's you got a hundred fifty thousand dollar mortgage on the line here. Your it point. is, but we also have attorney's fees on the line, so it's important for that as well. And, and attorney fees. Um, because we do have an argument for attorney's fees based upon equitable subrogation into the HSBC mortgage. Um, and we filed a motion for attorney's fees in this case. Uh, if we went on either of these two arguments, because we would subrogate into the HSBC mortgage that has a prevailing party attorney fee provision. And under the concurring opinion in SunTrust Bank versus Riverside National Bank, and there's also an unpublished order in uh, PNC Bank versus Cato. Uh, and I can give you the case number on that. It's uh, 2D172811, uh, where this court has previously awarded appellate attorney's fees on an equitable lien for equitable subrogation. So uh, the lower court's basis for denying the equitable lien for equitable subrogation was that there was fraud on the part of Erico and an adequate remedy at law. Um, and neither of those bases is valid. Um, in fact, fraud on the part of someone to a mortgage is almost a prerequisite to equitable liens for equitable subrogation. And the leading case is Palm Beach Savings and Loan Association versus Fishbein. It's a Florida Supreme Court case where the Florida Supreme Court reversed the fourth DCA after it reversed a trial court uh, order for closing an equitable lien. Um, and in Fishbein- well, well, let's just separate out that issue because if we got to that as a separate issue, Mrs. Adams indicated that, oh, this is not model from heaven. This was a payment for services because they were gonna hook up on the house flipping endeavor. So, so her mortgage gets paid off for a comparatively smaller sum. So if that testimony was believed, there would be some finding of fact by the court saying, oh yeah, that was payment compensation. They paid it off. So uh, Erico, we don't, we don't, you lose on the equitable lien. So you could technically, in your, in your view, if you went on the mortgage, it, it, the equitable lien is out. But if you lost on the mortgage, you could technically lose on the equitable lien under a different theory. And I'm not sure that's, that's something we could get to under these facts because the judge didn't really make specific findings on that. Well, we didn't provide Erico with money for any services rendered. Uh, Jack Capital loaned him money or Erico or Market King money pursuant to a promissory note that was secured by a mortgage on the Adams property. And, and some of the money you provided was used to pay that, but we, do we really know all this? Was that in the, was that in evidence? Yes. Uh, okay. every fact necessary. Is it the closing statement? Okay. We have the closing statement. We tied all the funds. In fact, there was a request for admissions prior to trial where many of these facts were admitted. Gotcha. Um, and that request for admissions is in the record and is cited to in the initial brief. All right. You um, wanted five minutes for rebuttal, right? Yes, Your Honor. All right, you're at six and a half. You got a minute and a half if you need it. Thank you. I'll just, I, I'll, I'll move on to the reversal of the lower court's award of attorney's fees to the Adams. Although the court found that the mortgage was unenforceable, it still awarded attorney's fees to the Adams under the mortgage. And that violates uh, Wells Fargo Bank National Association right. versus Bird, as well as the uh, Middle District's holding- the mortgage that was voided. So that right. that's that's- pretty flagrant error there. Yes, Your Honor, I agree. And without, uh, we would ask that the court uh, reverse remand for entry of foreclosure in favor of uh, Jack Capital and award appellate attorney's fees and I'll reserve the balance of my time for rebuttal. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna give you the full five. Uh, Mr. Powers, you've got uh, the pleasure of going next. Good afternoon, Your Honors. I my name is Robson Powers and I represent the uh, police at Katrina Adams and John Adams. Um, one of the things I want to kind of focus this court's attention on is the fact that this is a court of equity that we're going into. Um, this is a what? The, a court of equity. Can you hear me okay, Your Honor? Yeah, no, I, I didn't hear, hear the word equity. I understand the argument now. Proceed. Okay. And, and so the initial complaint is for a quiet title and the counterclaim is for foreclosure seeking to invoke the court's equitable powers uh, to 
make a remedy under these specific facts that are presented to the trial judge. And that's what was done in this particular case. The well, issue well, let's just back up a little bit. It's pretty apparent to me, having been a trial judge, that the judge didn't like what happened here. He was not a fan of the fraud that the Ericos committed. But you can't make something factually different than what occurred. He didn't find fraud by JAK Capital. He found no wrongdoing by JA Capital. He didn't even find a right to inquire further by JA Capital. The fraud was committed by Arico. And then there was that little notary party at the Olive Garden. But I, I'm not sure a court of equity can do equity to the people that were harmed by Arico by taking it out of the hide of Jack Capital. And that's to me the judge is what they did here. And I don't, I don't see the connection without J.A. J. A. Jack doing something wrong. So you got to tell me what they did wrong, not that it, this whole thing stinks, stinks and it's inequitable, because it is. Very well, Your Honor. The specific finding from the trial judge uh, is contained in paragraph... Uh, 20, okay, where he specifically addresses the fact that Jack Capital knew that this property, the property to be collateralized, was not owned by Market King, um, didn't take any steps to confirm that the owners of the property consented to the mortgage, um, that they did nothing to confirm that there was any sort of connection between Katrina Adams and Market King. Unlike the cases cited by the appellants, each and every one of those cases, there was two innocent parties. Okay? There was the homeowner that was induced into signing or didn't sign a mortgage. And there was the, uh, I would say, quote unquote, innocent bank. We don't have that in this particular case. The distinction from in this particular case, especially compared with the Dines decision, was that there was fault placed squarely on the part of the bank in this particular case. They don't come in here with fully unclean hands, okay? They come in here with fault, okay, that the trial court was aware of because Thomas Erico signed the promissory note, didn't own the property, and then they loaned him $150,000 without more, okay, without any additional information, any sort of connection, even any correspondence between them and the, the actual mortgage, which would have been uh, the Adamses. Um, and so that's the connection that was made in this particular case. So the fraud and the forgery were pled, okay? They were all issues that were brought before the court. Jack Capital agreed that the court would exert its equitable powers in order to render a decision in this particular case regarding the mortgage and regarding the quiet title action. So what we have here is a court making a decision upon facts that were presented to it, facts that are not being contested in this appeal, uh, which show that the mortgage was not valid. Now we had argued- Mr. Powers, let me ask you a question. Referencing back to paragraph 20 of the amended final judgment, is there a legal obligation on the part of Jack Capital to take the step that's outlined in that paragraph other than the judge feeling, other than the judge's uh, statement there? In other words, the judge says that Mark, they took no steps to, to confirm that the owners of the property consented to the mortgage. Is that something that's required of a lender? That's something that's not normally required of a lender. But in this particular case, when you have are going to give $150,000 to someone who doesn't own the property, and you're coming into a court of equity to see if you're going to enforce that mortgage, then it's certainly a factor that the court can consider. Uh, and especially in deciding... Uh, among two innocent parties, who is the least negligent? In the cases cited by the appellant, there were clearly signing documents that were labeled a mortgage. The Dines case even said that the mortgage or the document that was presented to the owners was very clearly a mortgage. We don't have that here. It was in dispute and the testimony at trial by both Katrina Adams and John Adams was that there was a kitchen agreement um, that didn't have the terms of the mortgage, that didn't say mortgage anywhere, that didn't refer to Jack Capital anywhere on it whatsoever. Um, so these are important key distinctions that we have in this particular case. You're saying that the bank, you said compare that, that, that the bank was trying to deduce who was the more negligent party. 
and excuse me, the trial court was trying to deduce who was the more negligent party as, as, as a part of its role in doing equity. And the bank was more negligent by relying on a notarized signature than the Adamses were and, um, and not knowing that they were signing a mortgage. Well, the, what the trial court found was that the bank made no connection between the owners of the property and their consenting to a mortgage. No communication back and forth between them um, no, you know, sort of, you know, hey, we're, you're not connected with Market King, or are you connected with Market King? There was absolutely no communication. But, but doesn't that go to a, to, to a defense that wasn't pled? They didn't really plead fraud. They pled forgery. We didn't sign it. So the, the duty of JAK was never alleged to be part of the fraud. The bank, I mean, the trial judge pigeonholed shoehorn relief that wasn't pled. You can't do that when you're required to plead fraud with specificity in the first instance under the rules of civil procedure. So this is this is a rationale the judge came up with, but it didn't exist in the pleadings and the motion to conform was denied. Well, I'll, what I'll say to that is that forgery is a species of fraud. The issue of fraud and of forgery were both litigated before the trial court without objection. Uh, why was there a motion to amend to conform the pleadings? If you're, if you're, I'm sorry, say if you allege forgery, then that's fraud for every purpose. Specificity requires more than saying, I didn't sign something and therefore it's open season on every form of fraud. I, I, I don't see the rule allowing that. Although there's no, there's no reason for a rule because well, yeah, you did allege forge, forgery, and I didn't sign it, but you didn't prove other forms of fraud because it wasn't pled. And well, the judge found found all this as a reason, you know, they gave up the, the laundry list of reasons to support his, his judgment because he didn't like what happened. I wouldn't have liked it either, but I'm stuck with the facts that are that are proven and pled. And I, you, you gotta show me something else besides paragraph 20 that JAK did wrong, that they actively did something wrong other than saying, hey, I'm giving a mortgage, <laughs> I'm relying on this uh, mortgage normal on its face, regular on its face. Well, what else like you I, got? Again, I cite back to the Dines decision because there was two innocent parties. In that particular case, um, the the son-in-law, you know, induced his uh, parents-in-law to sign a mortgage, and the court said we're stuck. Uh, between two innocent parties, and we have to look and determine who is the least negligent. And in that particular case, well, the mortgage the point, was found enforceable, and in, uh, you said Dines, right? That is correct. I'm, the mortgage I'm, was found to be enforceable. That was the, the one with the incompetent person. The it was Dines. It was held to be enforceable, not because they were incompetent, uh, but because they found that the document that was presented to the homeowners was very clearly a mortgage. Which is not what we have in this case. It's the a judge very okay. It's a what very did the judge say that made it not a mortgage. Is there a finding of fact saying that that's not a mortgage here? Uh, yes, Your Honor. It was disputed. Um, Just tell me the paragraph number. This twenty-six. Let me get that for you. Because basically, it's some sort of a of a uh, second paragraph or something. Paragraph 10, All right. where the court says exhibit one is entitled mortgage and security agreement on its face, wherein the mortgager Katrina Adams, joined by her husband John Adams, agrees to a mortgage with mortgagee Jack Capital LLC. Right. And, and Mr. Adams disputes that these details were present at the time of the purported signing. And what does the judge say? And I believe them over Jack Capital. How is that relevant? That's just a statement of testimony that's like a transcript that doesn't move the ball forward in my mind well i think where the ball is moved forward your honor is that the the guilt and fault of jack capital in not pursuing and not determining that the owners actually consented to the property that's found within the four corners of the amended judgment that's found within the testimony that was presented uh, to the trial court and the adamses are the least 
uh, are the most innocent parties uh, in all of this and shouldn't be held responsible for $150,000 mortgage that they did not uh, consent to. Well, they did we, not we have to go back to. to the origins of this a little bit too, though, right? Because I mean, the, Katrina Adams wanted to get into business with Mr. Enrico. It wasn't like she was duped into, into this by him. She, she trusted him and that was to her downfall, to her detriment. But she, she wanted to do business with him, wanted to flip houses with him. And she understood that that would require documents and money and whatnot. And, and it was a, a business relationship that she put her trust in him. And then he double crossed her. Well, I would agree that they were looking to enter into a business relationship, but the specific finding in, of the court was that Katrina Adams did not knowingly give the, any information for the purpose of placing a mortgage on her homestead property. In fact, repeatedly during the trial, uh, of the two-day trial, and in the final ju judgment itself, it's repeated that there was never an intent to place a mortgage on the homestead property. And so uh, what happened subsequent in terms of the giving of the information was because of Thomas Errico and his deceit. Um, if the court would permit, I can, you know, speak uh, a little bit about the equitable lien argument. Well, he he did mention it. You can go there. Thank you, Your Honor. The the reason that an equitable lien fails in this particular case is one, there's an adequate remedy at law. There's a promissory note signed by Thomas Errico in the file for one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. They can certainly pursue the promissory note. It's well, does, does the unjustment enrichment of, of the Adamses uh, uh, obviate um, the need to consider the, the consequence of, the, of an adequate remaining law? Well, and I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because we don't consider that to be an unjust enrichment, okay? The testimony at trial and the finding from the trial court in paragraph 12 of the final judgment was that Katrina Adams was anticipated to being being compensated for the work and services that were performed for her for Market King, okay? And they were waiting for that money to come in. She has just been paid the monies that were due to her, okay? This isn't a situation where she's unjustly is it, enriched. Is, is that record, is that a finding or is that a re record evidence that that was why the it was paid off? Well, the findings of fact are, have not been contested in this particular case. And what was argued and what was said at, in the testimony at trial was that the, the payment um, or the, the payment to the HSBC loan was just in furtherance of the payment for her services to market. But she assumed that that was an assumption on her part. There's no act actual testimony to say we had an agreement they'd pay off my, my uh, loan. Well, Your Honor, there's been no showing that this was a, an unjust enrichment. This is not a windfall like the courts are afraid of seeing in other particular cases. Oh, this was payment. Um, gotcha. and, and even if um, uh, the court were to ignore that there's an adequate remedy at, at law, this is still a court of equity. So the court can decide after evaluating all the circumstances to decline giving an equitable lien in this particular case. And that's what was done. Um, the, the court disagreed with the actions of Jack Capital and of Thomas Errico and could properly deny the request for subrogation of, of the lien. So the, the court's final judgment should be affirmed as to that issue. Um, if the court has no further question, I can move on to the, the final issue as to the attorney's fees. Sure, move on. Um, the, the main distinction here is that the court, well, we first argued that there was no mortgage, but that's not what the, the court found. We agree that the court found uh, something different than what was argued, um, but the court found that a mortgage did exist, okay? And so if the mortgage exists, but is not held, is not enforceable, there's still a right to recover attorney's fees under 57105 subsection 7, which is reciprocal in nature. The mortgage in this case has an attorney fee provision that is very broad. Um, it, it allows for attorney's fees in the event of a you know, enforcement of the mortgage in a foreclosure action or otherwise, okay, which would include the quiet title action. And it would include um, all the events, including the appeal of this case. So what we have here is an attorney fee provision, a contract that the trial court found was signed but not enforceable. So because it exists, we're not stopped and we're not prevented from claiming and asserting our rights 
to the attorney fee provision. And so that's why the award for, of attorney's fees was proper. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. That brings us back to your opponent, Mr. Owen, you've got five minutes. Thank you, uh, Your Honor. Uh, I think I just heard Mr. Powers admit that the uh, lower court, argue, or the argument that the Adams made in the lower court was for forgery, but that isn't what the court found. And that alone well, is- Why don't you hone in on that paragraph 20? Because he's saying that's sufficient to do some sort of equitable fraud finding here. Well, paragraph 20 uh, is the statement where the court finds that uh, Jack Capital was aware the property was not owned by Market King, but there were no steps taken to confirm that the owners of the property consented to the mortgage. Right. Uh, most noteworthy, the court finds that Jack Capital did nothing to confirm that there was any connection between Katrina Adams and Market King. You've got a good memory because uh, that's exactly what it says. In Ocean Bank versus Miami versus in Unicorp, uh, the court held that there's no duty to investigate on the part of a lender. Uh, lenders are entitled to rely upon regular notarized mortgages. But I guess what, if you combine that with the fact that we know they didn't own it, does that create some sort of negligence or further duty that should have been due diligence that should have been done to make sure there was consent by the owner? There's no authority for that in the case law, but the record would show that there was additional due diligence that was done. Uh, and it wasn't just that Mr. Errico defrauded the Adams into signing a document. He also defrauded them into providing him with copies of their driver's licenses and homeowner's insurance policy. He defrauded them into allowing a broker to access the interior of the property for purposes of performing an appraisal. Uh, he also he defrauded them into obtaining a payoff on the mortgage from HSBC, and he defrauded them into providing a, a survey for the property. So those are all things that Jack Capital- Well, that's inconsistent required. with the finding that they didn't know there was a mortgage being put on the property. Um, I believe it is, but that is the finding of the court, and it's still under the law supports foreclosure of the, the mortgage. Um, You're also saying that's consistent with uh, the Jack Capital being lulled into the suspicion that they needed to do no, no more due diligence. I, I agree. Yeah, right. um, <clears throat> so th there's an argument made, made by the Adams that uh, they were the less negligent party. I, I submit that that's not the case. Uh, they were the more negligent party, like the borrowers in the Dines case. They signed a document that on its face purports to be a mortgage, and there's a finding of fact in the final judgment that says exhibit one is a mortgage on its face. But they also signed a single page guarantee that is a guarantee on its face and both of those documents are in the record. Notably, the kitchen agreement that Mr. Powers referred to is not in the record. So just like the uh, Smith case where they said they signed documents but they didn't recall exactly what they were, they weren't produced in the record and the court uh, reversed or not the Smith case, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Grandway Credit Corporation case. Um, we have, you know, it, it's pretty clear that the lower court committed uh, an error in reaching its conclusions of law. And um, even if, uh, like one final point here, even if fraud were pled, the Erico's allegations of fraud on the part of Erico is not sufficient to uh, invalidate the mortgage uh, that's the Dines case where it was fraud on the part of the son-in-law that induced them to sign the mortgage. Uh, fraud on the part of Erico is insufficient. So this court should reverse the lower court's final judgment, uh, refusing to foreclose the mortgage, remand with directions to um, foreclose the mortgage, and award attorney's fees in favor of Jack Capital rather than the Adams. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, I want to thank you both. And, uh, and we're done now. That's the end of the calendar today. The judges are going to meet separately. Uh, so we're going to sign off. Bye-bye.